Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is John Seed. He's the founder of the Rainforest Information Center and has dedicated his life to the protection of rainforests and their biodiversity since 1979. In 1995, he was awarded the Order of Australia Medal, OAM, by the Australian government for services to conservation of the environment. He also practices permaculture and is interested in the huge role that unsustainable agriculture plays in the destruction of native forests, rivers, and reefs. Today, we talk about efforts to stop some planned mining in Ecuador. So first, thank you for your decades of unparalleled work. And second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, you're most welcome, Derek. Thanks for inviting me. So people may not know much about Ecuador or the mining that's planned in Ecuador or the reserves in Ecuador. So can you can you give us an introduction to all three of those? Okay, well, uh, first about Ecuador, it, it is the most biodiverse country on Earth on a sort of per square kilometre basis, on the basis of its size. So it's the most biodiverse place on Earth. And the area where much of the proposed mining is um, being planned is in the Andes, which um, scientists say is the most diverse, the most biodiverse of the Earth's 36 biodiversity hotspots. So uh, this is uh, a horrible conjunction of the most um, toxic industry in the world with the most precious environment. Um, concerning reserves, um, we became involved in the late 1980s when um, we uh, had found um, a good alliance with the um, sort of left-wing a government uh, of Australia at that time, and they had um, <clears throat> had a Senate inquiry into the environmental effects of the Australian aid program, which we had initiated and, and lobbied for. And as part of the outcome of that inquiry, the Senate uh, mysteriously <coughs> insisted that the Australian aid agency, AusAid, spend a million dollars a year on um, inviting NGOs like ourselves to uh, create uh, new standards of environmental excellence in the delivery of Australian aid. So one of the uh, funding, uh, uh, one of the projects that got funded at that time was the creation of the Los Cedros Biological Reserve uh, in the Andes, um, which uh, we were sort of instrumental. Uh, one of our volunteers in Ecuador at that time, Doug Ferguson, uh, together with Jose de Coup, who has been the director of that reserve ever since, were instrumental in um, gaining um, the uh, uh, status of Bosque Protector, Protected Forest. And we've been helping uh, Jose to protect that reserve ever since. Um, 30 years ago, when we first started this, it was, you know, a highly diverse area. Uh, but in the meantime, nearly all of the other similar areas have been despoiled for one reason or another, so that now Los Cedros, uh, according to Professor Biddy Roy uh, from the University of Oregon, one of the many scientists who conduct research there, it is now the uh, best forested watershed in uh, western Ecuador. And so it was with, uh, uh, you know, quite a shock that we learned about a year ago through um, a press release from a mining company, a Canadian mining company, Cornerstone Resources, we learned that they uh, believed that they had a mining concession that covered Los Cedros. And as we investigated this, we discovered that this was just uh, the tip of a huge iceberg and uh, our you know, a relatively small reserve, about 7,000 hectares, uh, maybe 17,000 acres, um, was uh, one of 39 Bosque Protector that had been uh, secretly uh, handed over to the mining industry, mining companies from Australia, Chile, China, you name it, um, Canada, of course, totaling uh, more than 750,000 hectares and um, probably 1,800 acres, and that as well as that, uh, more than a million hectares, two and a half million acres of indigenous reserves, um, mostly in the Amazon, uh, had been handed over to the mining companies at the same time. Um, in 2016, the amount of 
Ecuador that was uh, covered by mining concessions went up from 3% to 14%. So an extra 11% of Ecuador uh, was handed over to mining companies with no fanfare, with no announcements, with no publicity, and certainly without the prior consent of the indigenous inhabitants or the people that were, uh, you know, uh, running these biological reserves and the many governments around the world who had funded their creation, like the Australian government. So... Um, in recent months, Ecuadorian civil society has uh, um, formed a, you know, an impressive coalition of environment groups, uh, social justice groups, because certainly um, social justice is another huge, uh, social injustice is another huge feature of the mining industry in um, in South America or anywhere in the world, um, and but also local governments who. Um, have joined this coalition calling for, uh, the, um, that these, that these concessions be, um, uh, rescinded and that there be no mining in, uh, watersheds and protected areas and indigenous reserves and so on. So, uh, at the Rainforest Information Centre, uh, we're, um, starting an international campaign in support of Ecuadorian civil society and in support of their demands. Uh, basically, uh, to, uh, see if we can help to create a sense that the world is watching while Ecuador tries to create, um, a, um, a national debate about the future of development in that country and whether it's going to be extractivism or whether they might follow, um, the path of countries like Costa Rica, which has much better economic indicators than uh, Ecuador, in spite of the fact that no mining uh, whatsoever is allowed there. So, I know this is an unfair question, because you just mentioned that 11% of the country has been uh, put on the block here, put on the mining block, which is a lot of territory, but can you introduce people, briefly introduce people to the uh, to the landscape of Ecuador that is threatened. I mean, you, you said that it's one of the most biodiverse hotspots, but who lives there? And are we talking, are these, are these mainly rainforests are going to be des destroyed or is it also, uh, um, brushland? I mean, what, 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 what are we talking about here for, so far as the, the, the biomes involved? Well, um, uh, because I recognize because we're talking yeah, about eleven percent of the country. Yeah, and and because um, I I haven't visited Ecuador in twenty years, and I'm coming at this entirely from an activist perspective about how do we uh, raise awareness and funding from around the world to uh, stop this from taking place. My own interest is uh, in uh, my main interest is in rainforests and uh, the uh, Los Cedros Reserve is covered in rainforests and I would certainly say that nearly all of the threatened areas are rainforests because um, most of the uh, undeveloped land in Ecuador is rainforests um, but there, there, there certainly will be other uh, biomes that are um, involved, and but I'm afraid I can't really uh, I can't really talk about that. Uh, talk about that. Um, what I will say is that the uh, uh, the whole thing looks like being illegal, and one of the one of the options that we're looking at is um, Ecuador was the first country in the world to include the rights of nature in its constitution. When the constitution was rewritten during a great period of turmoil and upheaval about 10 years ago, uh, which was largely led by the indigenous people who um, are more than half of uh, Ecuador's population, um, the rights of nature were included. And so... Um, one of the um, one of the things that we're looking at is is a class action suit on behalf of the threatened um, on behalf of the threatened um, natural areas um, and where 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 the where where the nature itself is the plaintiff and we um, and we the constitution may give us the right to speak on behalf of the earth. That's great. <clears throat> um, so another another. Question I want to ask here is: You said that uh, a lot of the local governments oppose these mining concessions, and 
I, I don't know anything about the politics of Ecuador. I'm mainly, I've been an activist in the United States. I know in the United States we have a terrible difficulty because no matter how destructive some project is, quite often local governments will push it. Um, local, local governments are quite often extremely reactionary and frankly greedy in the United States. So do we have a different dynamic in Ecuador? Um, I, I had the same reaction. This is fairly recent news. The last couple of months that this is uh, uh, that this uh, coalition has formed, and uh, I've been sort of wondering when I'm going to find out more about uh, Ecuadorian politics, because of course Australia, uh, you, the way that you describe local governments in the United States would describe Australia to a T. And so I think part of the part of the thing is that because of the huge indigenous population. Uh, at least in certain parts of Ecuador, the local governments are much more um, actually representing uh, the ordinary people rather than being the political class as they are in Australia and no doubt in the United States. So how did this how did this this happen? You keep saying that it was pretty surreptitious. How what happened to cause these concessions to be sprung upon the people? Well, I guess the first thing that happened was that um, about 15 years ago, the World Bank funded a, um, a program, many millions of dollars, to do geological surveys in um, which included protected areas in Ecuador, even national parks, even icons like the Cotacachi Chiapas Biological Reserve. Uh, they... Uh, both um, flew uh, flew over the areas and um, conducted geological surveys from the air and also uh, um, on the ground. So our director uh, at that time, um, Ruth Rosenheck from the Rainforest Information Centre director, was visiting Los Cedros, and there's a uh, there's a kind of uh, a tale of how she chased these prospectors off Los Cedros Reserve um, at, at, at that time. And uh, um, and so uh, a, a geological map of likely uh, spots of interest to the mining industry was created by the World Bank. And part of their mission at that time was also to draw up proposals or suggestions for a new legislative framework that would make it easier for mining companies to gain access. And so... Uh, uh, the mining industry uh, last year awarded Ecuador uh, their award of the um, the best country in the world, the most favourable country in the world for mining because of this um, uh, this uh, beautiful new regulatory framework that the government kind of slipped into place, which just ma- makes it like a tax holiday. Uh, um, they can they can uh, uh, you know have their head office in uh, the Cayman Islands or somewhere where you know they they can avoid taxes in a thousand different ways and basically it's um, it's a very sweet uh, deal economically for the mining companies and uh, the and then uh, the government uh, must have auctioned off these areas but we don't know anything about that all that we know is uh, who owns which concession and and the process as to which to the way that this happened is uh, is completely mysterious and uh, and hidden. So uh, yesterday, the government of Ecuador announced that no new mining concessions would be handed out. So I believe that means that the campaign and the fact that people have found out and are starting to gather uh, in protest is beginning to have some impact. And the question is, uh, you know, okay, that's a good start, no more. But then, how far can we wind it back? And um, um, that's kind of, of course, impossible to know. Um, the other factor besides uh, the World Bank writing a new set of laws for Ecuador is that the Chinese have uh, come in to rescue Ecuador when oil prices dropped and uh, the sort of left-wing government um, uh, couldn't, uh, you know, keep up payments for the ambitious social programs and other programs uh, they borrowed uh, many billions of dollars from the Chinese, and um, uh, you know we're we're confident that uh, these concessions, many of them to Chinese companies, uh, uh, you know, are part of the um, quid pro quo. Let's talk about the 
effects of mining on rainforests in general and what you have seen over the the, de- the decades of, of your work. Um, so so well, just let's be very clear about what mining does to to the land. Well, I mean, th- the first thing that it does is that the roads that allow the equipment in become the roads that allow illegal logging, poaching, uh, and um, land, uh, you know, the use of... You know, the land development, illegal land development, all kinds of things can gain access through into areas that were previously very, very difficult to access. Um, then what we're talking about here with these concessions isn't mining, but mining exploration. And a lot of people say, oh, they're only exploring, you know, it's not like they're going to dig you know, big holes in the ground many kilometres wide and then have millions and millions of tonnes of tailings uh, pouring toxic uh, heavy metals into the rivers and so on and so on. They're only exploring. But uh, the interesting thing is uh, that apart from the physical damage caused by exploration, because, of course, they need roads to explore, and uh, we've got lots of photographs of areas where exploration has taken place and uh, it, it's not pretty at all, um, the um, the process of exploration from the mining company's point of view is uh, how to corrupt the local population and bring them into the picture. And so they will typically promise, make incredible promises about how many people are going to be employed and that they're going to get four times as much as they earn as farmers and they buy sewing machines for the women and they do all kinds of amazing things to ingratiate themselves with the population and to make sure that if they find anything, uh, there's going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, they're going to have uh, strong alliances with local people uh, on their side. So uh, there's this incredible process of corruption of the social fabric that's going on during the exploration phase. And one of the one of the projects that we're uh, looking for funding for at the moment is that um, one of the bravest of the activists who've been working in that area in the Andes to try and stop mining for more than 20 years in the Intag region, very close to Los Cedros, is Carlos Zoria, and, um, you know, who's had threats to his life and has been named by the president of the country as being, you know, a traitor and so on and so on. And he and his colleagues want to make a film of interviews with the miners in areas where the mining has come and gone and what the promises were and what the impacts were because uh, it turns out that it ends up looking very, very different, as I'm sure, you know, won't surprise you, looks very, very different from the promises made by the mining companies. But um, in those areas where the exploration has been allowed, uh, the mining companies do have a very strong sort of subversive element within the community that will undermine. Uh, and, you know, and, and also there's a huge amount of corruption that's involved. Uh, they are hiring, uh, you know, indigenous leaders to, to divide those communities. They cause an incredible uh, amount of havoc um, socially. And the corruption goes to the highest level so that uh, a couple of months ago, the vice president of Ecuador, a man called Glass, ended up in jail for uh, accepting bribes. And um, it's, 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 it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of horrible corrupting atmosphere, not only of the environment where most of the environmental corruption takes place during the actual mining phase, that the, the amount of destruction that takes place from, um, the exploration is relatively small, although, of course, you know, fragmenting habitats by putting roads in, it's much easier to put in a road than it is to close it later, and uh, so on and so on. And then the rainforests themselves, we, uh, on our website, um, Biddy Roy and her colleagues who um, uh, published um, uh, the, the, the kind of scientific paper uh, with the maps of the areas where this uh, where these concessions have been surreptitiously granted, is working on a report uh, on the biodiversity of the areas involved, and um, uh, you know many papers have been written about the effects of mining um, 10 kilometres, 50 kilometres, 100 kilometres from the mine, and the uh, effects on biodiversity are visible. Um. Can you tell me a little bit more about that before we move on to some more social justice stuff. Um, 
what would be some of the effects? Um, well, how, how, I mean, would it, how would it have an effect a hundred miles from from the mine? I'm not disagreeing. I just really want to know. Yeah, yeah, and no, I understand. And uh, and I wish I, uh, you know, uh, I wish uh, some of my colleagues were here who would be able to give you a much more satisfactory answer. But uh, uh, it's just that many of the species that we're talking about, a huge amount of Ecuador has already been. Uh, cleared for agriculture and for this, that, and the other thing. Many of the species, I believe that Los Cedros has 60 endangered species on this small area of, um, you know, se- uh, you know, 17,000 acres, relatively small area. And, uh, that, um, so that, uh, you know, as, um, you know, these species, some of them have quite large ranges, especially the big cats and so on, so that, um, you know, as they are, uh, as they are driven closer to local extinction, um, that has effects on the populations further afield. And so I'm not exactly sure of the mechanism, but I do know that, uh, sort of before and after studies have traced the impacts of the mine to many, many, uh, many, many uh, kilometres from the site of the mine itself. And especially downstream, the impacts go all the way to the ocean because of the acid mine drainage that inevitably follows when uh, they dump the tailings, um, in, you know, they dump the, the they dump the tailings. The the the, the um, you know cyclonic rains uh, leach the um, heavy metals out of those tailings, and uh, they destroy the ecology of the streams all the way to the uh, uh, either the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. You know, I'm thinking about about the the harming the the, the species a hundred miles away, and. My question was kind of silly, I realized, because we've seen this a bunch where, you know, if you, when fish and wildlife traps a creature and puts it out in the wild, quite often it, it dies because you're putting it in somebody else's habitat, I mean, somebody else's home. You, you move a bear, there's already a bear living there. And, yeah. and in this case, if you're displacing somebody, they're going to displace somebody else, is going to displace somebody else, is going to displace somebody else. And we see this all the time with indigenous humans too, where, you know, as the as the white people went across this continent, there was a wave of refugees in front of them, who were who were often fleeing, and then that would create social dislocation in people hundreds of miles away because there's this influx of refugees, and and we we can assume the same thing would be absolutely true with non humans, where the refugees then crowd out those who live there. Um, that's a very good point, and I'm I'm, I'm sure that's correct, and it actually reminds me of. Uh, a friend and colleague, um, Alistair McIntosh, who wrote about the impact of the British um, colonising Scotland and the Scots fleeing to Canada and, you know, wreaking the same havoc in Canada as had, as, as had befallen them, you know, until the English, until the English, uh, um, you know, turned uh, Scotland into sort of uh, little hunting estates and things like that and, uh, and destroyed the... Uh, the, the social cohesion and the livelihood of the people there, there's no reason, no way anybody would have, uh, you know, taken a perilous trip to Canada. And once they're in Canada, they do the same thing uh, to the people who are already living there. So there's this incredible uh, knock-on effect. So let's talk about the, the, the history in mining of social injustice because it doesn't matter whether we're talking about heading into the black hills of the dakotas or whether we're talking about the gold rush of 1849 in the united states in california when you see this i mean it's around the world mining is notorious for human rights abuses so can you talk just a little bit about about that in your experience especially as it relates to uh the the humans who live in or near uh, rainforests in your experience or in your in your work well i mean the um, the, the the disruption of the you know indigenous world by any kind of development so called development um, is um, you know it's uh, ubiquitous that there's nowhere uh, in, in australia you know uh, in anywhere that i've ever been where this disruption doesn't take place. And in certain countries, uh, it's done at the point of a gun. So at the moment, um, the military 
are um, like are in the Shua territory in the Amazon, and that's related to the fact that 50% of their territory has now been conceded to mining companies, and um, 75% of the Awa territory on the Colombian border in the Andes has been uh, conceded uh, to mining companies. So, uh, you know, and uh, so, you know, people are killed, uh, uh, indigenous people are killed, environmental activists are killed, you know, people, people who oppose the, uh, uh, the, the spread of mining are killed. I mean, there's a huge um, uh, amount of money involved and uh, according to the mining company press, they anticipate uh, an extra $8 billion in investment over the next two or three years in Ecuador based upon this new regulatory frame, framework. And uh, I have no idea what that translates to into profits, but I'm sure it's uh, a hell of a lot more than $8 billion given uh, the uh, sweet uh, tax deals and, you know, labor laws and all of the rest of it that, uh, that the Ecuadorian government with the help of the World Bank has, uh, has created for them. So, um, but, um, yeah, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm much more at home looking at um, the mechanics of uh, running a blockade in Australia or the United States or of uh, the mechanics of um, creating a crowdfund to, uh, you know, help support these things than I am with the details on the ground. I've spent very little time myself in the countries uh, involved. Many of my colleagues have spent their lives there, you know. So uh, I, I feel like um, um, I'm coming across uh, a little bit uh, ignorant because I am. Um, what I know is that uh, the rainforests are the very womb of life. They're home to more than half of the species of plants and animals in the world. And the satellite photographs are showing them disappearing at a rate that um, there's no doubt that we're witnessing um, a mass extinction event that comparable to the demise of the dinosaurs or any of the other huge extinction events where more than half of the species of plants and animals present at the beginning of such an event uh, have disappeared at the end, and the only question is uh, how how severe is this going to be? That's that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting to limit the severity of uh, this extinction spasm because uh, um, I, I believe that when the dinosaurs uh, were extinguished, uh, approximately half of the species of plants and animals that were alive at the time disappeared with them. But um, uh, before that, 230 million years ago, at the end of the Permian era. Uh, there was an extinction event where more than 90% of all of the species living on Earth uh, disappeared. Um, we know, well, we believe that we know that it was a, it was an asteroid and a kind of nuclear winter scenario that followed that uh, uh, caused the uh, uh, extinction spasm 65 million years ago. There's no scientific consensus as to what happened 230 million years ago. All that we know is that wherever we are in the world, as we dig down and as we come to that layer, we come to a layer where suddenly um, 90 to 95% of all of the species disappear. And uh, and we're in the middle. So is it going to be 50% or is it going to be 95%? That may be something that we can have a say in still, you know. But the fact that uh, there's no doubt that uh, 100 million years from now, should there be a geologist around, they will see this extinction spasm written in the fossil record. And and in many ways, the, the, the most important thing that we can do, is, it's like an environmentalist friend of mine says, that as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure that some doors remain open. By which he means that if bull trout are still alive in 10 years, they may be alive in 100, but if they're gone in 10, they're gone. And so he basically has a not-on-my-watch attitude that... Uh, you know he's going to protect every wild being in every wild place he can, because because we can't know the future. That's right, and because it's not over till it's over, and um, you know once one has seen this, then it's difficult to find anything else very all that important, or for some people like myself, it's difficult to you know it's like the only game in town. Not because I have some 
hope of success because with your help, uh, I don't believe in hope. But um, but just because uh, what else is there to do under such circumstances? And um, so, uh, you know, I used to sort of um, believe that we were witnessing the um, emergence of a new consciousness among human beings during the 60s and the 70s. Many of us, I suppose, uh, had this uh, feeling that a new con- you know, we were watching the birth of a new consciousness, and I'm not completely cured of that yet. It's you know the 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 the, the sense that it's oh it's coming it's coming. Um, it, you know like it'd be hard to be confident about that. Like you'd have to be in denial to be confident about that. But the fact that it's a possibility um, remains. And so, because nothing less than that could save us, frankly, do you know, that uh, no technological change, no tinkering at the edges, that nothing could save us except a revolution in consciousness where human beings wake up to who we really are you know, part of this thing, you know, that there is no out there to dump our tailings. It's all in here. It's all cycling through us. We're just part of this incredible, enormous, beautiful worldwide web of biology. And that if we not only understood that intellectually, but experienced ourselves that way, if if the change in identity took place where we understood who we really are, underneath that thin veneer of social fictions of nationality and religion and all the rest of that nonsense, you know, then um, I, I, I believe that we're clever enough and the, te- and the technology exists where there's every chance that we could turn this thing around. So there's nothing missing except the correct understanding, the correct identification, the correct understanding of who we really are and where our interests really lie. And so, should that change take place, then I'm sure our descendants will be immensely grateful to whoever was able to protect this species or that species, because that is going to be the basis of where evolution will continue from, with humanity uh, reduced to a much, much more humble and much smaller presence, because of understanding that it's all that vast wildness out there is the only hope for a truly sustainable, in, you know, in geological terms, sustainable uh, future for humanity. So, you know, humans are a young species. Dinosaurs were around for 100 million years before uh, they were extinguished. We've just been around for, you know, a, a, a million years or two. And, of course, you know, we, like everything else that's alive today, have this incredible pedigree where, you know, when I'm feeling particularly morose, I think about the fact that every single one of my ancestors, going back to the first cell of life on Earth four billion years ago, every single one of those ancestors succeeded, at least in reaching the age of reproducing itself before it was consumed. Not a single one of those ancestors failed to pass life forward or I wouldn't be here talking shit with you, you know? And so um, so that's a, a tremendous pedigree and it gives me a feeling that there must... And, and every, every being that's alive today has that pedigree. So on the other hand, 99.99% of all species that ever existed are now extinct. It's very, very few that get through the sieve, especially of these mass extinctions, And so, you know, the fact that we've made it this far is absolutely no guarantee as to what happens next. But it does mean that a certain confidence in the possibility of making the necessary moves to get through this, you know, may be there. And the crucial piece then is um, both the change in consciousness and protecting everything uh, that we can uh, in terms of biology, uh, indigenous culture, uh, and um, the the old ways that, um, you know, uh, will help us to uh, uh, create a, a livable future. You know, so many indigenous, thank you for that, and so many indigenous people have said to me that the first and most important thing that we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. And one of the things that they've talked to me about, about that, is that one of the things that that means is transferring our loyalty away from the system to which we 
our loyalty is made to the system very young. And one of the things to do is to transfer our loyalty away from the system and back to the living earth. Uh, very beautifully put. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more or with them more. And uh, <clears throat> so apart from my practical conservation work, which started with um, the first blockade to protect the rainforest in 1979, uh, the first in the world that we know of, uh, in Terrania Creek, uh, just a few kilometres from where I was living in a sort of hippie meditation community and which turned my life around, that um, um, in, in all of that time, There's this sense that unless we can change this psychological dimension or spiritual dimension, uh, unless we understand why humans are behaving in such a self-defeating manner and do something about that, then none of the on-the-ground efforts is going to be, be sufficient. And so in, um, <clears throat> in the mid-80s, I, I came upon a philosophy of nature called deep ecology, which has had some kind of impact but not nearly as much as it deserves because it remains the only explanation that satisfies me as to, you know, what this is about, why we behave in this fashion. So this term deep ecology was coined by the um, uh, professor of philosophy from Oslo University, the late Arnie Ness, and uh, he said that underlying all of the symptoms of the environmental crisis is uh, the illusion of separation between human beings and the natural world, the illusion of separation. So it sounds a little mystical, but uh, all you have to do to understand what he meant is hold your breath for five minutes while you think about it. So, in other words, we don't, when we think about who we are, we don't think, oh, I'm a breather. But if we hold our breath for five minutes, it quickly becomes clear to us that whoever we think we are, unless we take another breath, it's, we're not going to be that for much longer. And it's the same with the food we eat and the water we drink, that we are uh, inextricably embedded in nature. We have no independent existence. But uh, according to Ness, as a result of anthropocentrism or human-centeredness, this illusion of separation has uh, sort of corrupted our psyches and corrupted our cultures for thousands and thousands of years. And he traces it back at least as far as the Old Testament and the idea that man was created in God's image, uh, you know, and uh, um, that uh, uh, nature is to be in fear and trembling of us while we subdue and dominate it. And uh, so that as a result of the psychological and cultural uh, forms that have been created by this uh, pernicious and mistaken view of life, you know, that Many indigenous societies understand that the world is a web and we're just one strand in that web and we're not the spider in the middle the way that we think that we are. And so with, uh, with Joanna Macy in uh, uh, about 1987, um, I began to create um, experiential processes to try to uh, give form to Arnie Ness's call. He said that what we need are community therapies to heal that illusion of separation, to heal our relations with the widest of all communities, that of all living beings. And so these um, experiential deep ecology workshops, the first of them was called the Council of All Beings, and I continue to uh, facilitate these, uh, oh, you know, eight or ten weekends of the year. And... Uh, um, that uh, I can't say that uh, they've taken off like wildfire or anything like that. The, the book that uh, Joanna and I wrote with Arnie Ness, uh, Thinking Like a Mountain Towards a Council of All Beings, which was published in 1988, uh, and uh, the text of which is available for free on the Rainforest Information Centre website, uh, it's been translated into a dozen languages and last year was translated into Mandarin. So, you know, uh, let's see. I mean, the information is out there. It hasn't really, it hasn't really found fertile ground yet. I'll have to, I'll be the first to admit. But, um, uh, on the other hand, things can change so quickly now that, um, uh, you know the story of the hundred monkeys? I don't think it's true, but it's a good kind of metaphor anyway. And I, I always think, imagine if there were 99 monkeys there and then I didn't show up. You know, like, like there's no way to tell whether 
whether, you know, what it is that might be the key to creating that change in consciousness and um, that could lead to the, um, could lead to the, uh, you know, protection of uh, the future of um, humanity and all of our Cenozoic era uh, buddies that um, we've co-evolved with. You know, one of the things that I've loved about your work for 30, 30 years now is that you combine that direct activism of protecting ground through, you know, whatever means are, um, are, are, are workable in that circumstance and also the spiritual work. And that's, um, that, that is, that is, I think an incredibly important combination. And I think that it is perfectly valid for some people to focus on spiritual work and some people to focus on physical, physical work, depending on their proclivities. But it, 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 there's a certain sort of magic that occurs when you can bring both of those together. Yes, I, I, I agree. And, and, and it, it reminds me that, you know, when, um, when we first started doing our direct actions, uh, the uh, very spiritual poet Gary Schneider came from California to do poetry readings in Australia and we went to see him and uh, he uh, introduced me to uh, Earth First. And he had a copy of the Earth First journal that he had with him. And I was so excited because we were doing, you know, this was the first really radical environment group I'd come across. And so I wrote to them and they said, well, send, you know, write for our journal. So I started to send them articles about the uh, uh, direct actions that we were doing in Australia for the rainforests. And, um, and they invited me over to start a rainforest campaign in the United States, which I did in 1986. I did a, uh, a road show with uh, Dave Foreman and Mike Rozell, two of the founders of Earth First, and uh, Cecilia Ostro. And we went all around uh, many, many uh, states for six weeks doing a, a show every night and uh, starting rainforest action groups and so on. And I went to my first Round River Rendezvous, which is the, I don't know if they still do it, I'm, I'm a bit out of touch, but it's the festival that Earth First used to have at least every year. And they would choose the site of the rendezvous uh, of a, um, a wilderness area that was close enough to a um, destructive development so that the day after the rendezvous, people would converge on the development and shut it down. So one of these, uh, I think the first one I went to was on the north rim of the Grand Canyon uh, where uh, we had this beautiful uh, four or five days in the wilderness and then we shut down uh, a nuclear power plant nearby. And uh, so I would, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I really like about Earth First is their distrust of woo-woo. They, they, they don't like crystals. They don't like the, the kind of new age. They rhyme new age they, they pronounce it newage and rhyme it with sewage and uh, and so on and um and and so I was in this peculiar position where I, you know like I was uh, uh, I I was well known to everybody there because of the writings that I'd done and I was known as an activist as part of a really successful movement in Australia that had protected lots and lots of rainforests through uh, direct action and blockades but here I was talking about deep ecology and doing workshops called the Council of All Beings. What could be more woo-woo than that? And so I started to hold workshops at the uh, Round River Rendezvous where I would try and point out the distinction between woo-woo and true woo-woo. You know, that there is actually, you know, like a baby that could be thrown out with the bathwater there and I claimed to be representing that baby, that there's something very, very important about the rituals and ceremonies that all indigenous peoples have always conducted to honour and uh, praise and worship and maintain that connection between the human and the rest of the natural world. You know, that this isn't something that's left to chance, that every every society has these experiential processes that uh, uh, many times during the year people gather to uh, remember all our relations and uh, to make sure that that human tendency to drift off into merely social and economic ways of looking at the world, that there is a kind of correction for that. And so I, I feel that the, um, that the uh, 
um, deep ecology work um, that I've done has been kind of instrumental in keeping me on the straight and narrow and, and re- just that I, I continually need to be reminded of who I really am underneath the stories that I tell myself. So we have about three or four minutes left and and to wind down, I have two questions. One of them is how can people find out more about your um, the, the, the Council of All Beings and those workshops and your work, your sort of deep ecological work and then the other question is, if people want to help with what is going on in Ecuador, what are, how can they find out more and how can they, and, and what can they do if they're in the United States, if they're outside the United States, whatever? Right, well, uh, the first question, um, basically the, the Rainforest Information Center website, the old website, um, um, rainforestinfo.org.au uh, but anyway if you do a search on Rainforest Information Centre or on my name you'll quickly find it there's a, um, a, a, a link on the welcome page called Deep Ecology that then links to like a treasure trove of information about the Council of All Beings and including my schedule but I'll have to say that I, 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 I haven't travelled outside uh, this kind of part of the world now for 10 years or so my own sort of Carbon uh, credits have been totally maxed out many years ago, and uh, but there are many people in the United States who offer uh, experiential deep ecology workshops. And uh, um, if you can't find it any other way, just send me an email. You'll find that connection on the website, and I'll put you in touch with it. And likewise, happy to um, send you links to answer any questions that you've got about that. And then as to the um, helping with Ecuador. There's a new website which is called uh, rainforestinformationcenter.org, rainforestinformationcenter.org, and that leads to uh, a petition that we're asking people to sign. And by signing that petition, you have the opportunity to leave a tick on the little box that says, uh, you can send me updates, keep me informed. You also have an opportunity to tick a little box that says volunteer, and um, because we could use lots and lots of help, I haven't got time to go into the details, but wherever you are in the world, you'd be able to help with this campaign. And it leads, there's a link from that petition to a crowdfund where uh, Paul Gilding, um, another Australian who was for uh, a long time the executive director of Greenpeace International, uh, likes this campaign and has offered to match uh, any funding up to $15,000 on a dollar-for-dollar dollar basis. So if you go to this crowdfund, you'll help us to support the uh, civil society in Ecuador to uh, try and turn this thing around, and your dollar will generate another dollar from Paul Gilding. So um, thanks so much, Derek. Uh, I'm uh, a deep admirer of your work. I believe that your kind of analysis of the situation is one of the few that goes deep enough into the real causes of, you know, and the real solutions. So uh, it's an honor to be on your program. Well, thank you so much. And it, it is an honor to speak with you too. And, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been John C. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.